Second Samuel, Second Samuel, chapter 23. And again, it's one of these passages which you look at and you think, I'm glad I'm not reading that. And I think, I wish I wasn't reading this because of all the names that are within it. But nevertheless, there are many things here to encourage us this evening as we look at the mighty men of God. We're reading from verse 8 of 2 Samuel 23. Where we find these are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joshed Bashbeth, the ta Tachamite, chief among the captains. He was also called Adino, the Exonite, because he had killed 800 men at one time. And after him was Eliza, the son of Dodo, the Horite, one of the three mighty men with David when he, they defiled the Philistines, who defied the Philistines, sorry, who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel retreated. He arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to pl plunder. And after him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Haurite, the Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. So the people fled from the Philistines, but he stationed himself in the middle of the field, defended it, and killed the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. Then three of the thirty chief men went down at harvest time and came to the David at the cave of Adullam. And the troop of the Philistines encamped in the valley of Rephraim. David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David said with longing, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of the water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of, the, of Bethlehem, that was by the gate, took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord, and he said, Far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is this not the blood of the men who were in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things were done by the three mighty men. Now Abishai, the son of Joab, the son of Zeruah, was chief among another three. He lifted his spear against 300 men and killed them and won a name among these three. Was he not a, the most honored of the three? Therefore he became their captain. However, he did not attain to the first three. Benaiah, the son of Jehoda, the son of a valiant man from Gebzeel, who had done many deeds, he had killed two lion-like heroes of Moab. He also had gone down and killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day, and he killed an Egyptian, a spectacular man. An Egyptian, the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, so he went down to him with a staff, wrestled the spear out of the Egyptian's hand, and killed him with his own spear. These things Benaiah, the son of Jehoda, did, and won a name among the mighty men. He was more honored than the thirty, but he did not attain to the first three, and David appointed him over his guard. Ashiel, the brother of Joab, was one of the thirty, Alina, the son of Dodo of Bethlehem, Shammah, the Herodite, Ekla, the Herodite, Heliza, the Parthite, Era, the son of Ekesh, the Tekronite, Abiza, the son of the Aphronite, the, the Aphronite Merberni, the Hushite, Zamon, the Horite, Ma Marai, the Nephthalite, Heber, the son of Benaiah, the Nephthalite, Itti, the son of Ribi, from Gebir, of the children of Benjamin, Benaiah, the son of Peraphronite, Hidi of the, from the brooks of Gash, Abai Alibon the Arabrite, 
Azrameth, they could have given them easier names, couldn't they? The bearer of right, Eliabah, the shall bride of the son, son of Sha Jashim, Jonathan, Shama the Harahite, Ahiram, the son of Shamra, the Harite, Elephet, the son of Ahashbai, the son of Macrophite, Elam, the son of Ahiphophel, the Gileonite, Hezrei, the son of the Carmelite, Carmel Parale, the Ar Arabite, Igal, the son of Nathan of Zoba, Beni, the Gadite, Zelek, the Amorite, Neherai, the Berethite, armor bearer of Job, the son of Zeroah, Erath, the Ephrite, Gereb, the Ephrite, and Uriah, the Hittite, 37 in all. Amen. The Lord give us blessing for this passage of the evening. But let's turn again to him. One day the Lord might provide someone to sing the bass line there that runs through. It's a lovely line, isn't it? God's influence on men is what we're looking at tonight. I haven't pressed the present button on the actual, on the actual uh, laptop. Over this side. There, that's that one. Thank you. God's influence on men. As you begin this chapter, in, ver in this section, in verse 8, it says, These are the names of the mighty men whom... David had. A couple of weeks ago we concluded uh, last time thinking about the impact of last words. We're all going to have them and we all have them all of the time. Last words we speak to individuals and the impact of them and David's last words were recorded. This time we look at the impact of David's example. David's example. We I mean, think for a moment of where this account really begins of David's life when we, Israel is introduced to him first, and he is introduced on the battlefield. Here are armed men prepared for war, but none of them prepared to fight. There's a giant who keeps coming out, Goliath by name, and he threatens them and he challenges them and says, come fight with me, just one of you, and if I win, we will, we will be victorious over you and you will serve us, and vice versa. And not one of those strong, prepared men is willing to go and to fight. Even the offer of marriage to the king, no amount of bribery or relief from taxes will get one of those men to shift from his place. Yet every time Goliath comes forth, they step back. And then comes this little scrap of a lad. He's a mere teenager. He's no man of war. He's a shepherd boy. He's claimed to be fighting against bear and lion. But what matches he from a man trained in war and a man of Goliath's size and stature? But word reaches the camp. David has said that this giant, this Philistine, this uncircumcised man, God will deliver him. His faith is in God. And so he walks out from the ranks of Israel's army with no armor, with no sword, with no spear, just a sling in his hand and five well-chosen stones from the brook. And Israel waits with bated breath. And then the stone flies and the giant falls. And something touches the hearts of men that day. Men who would ordinarily have been mighty men. And they see a man who believes in God, a boy who believes in God, and they watch him and they think to themselves, if this boy one day becomes leader of Saul's army or comes to fight, I will follow him. I'll go where he goes because his God will be my God and I will trust him. And so as a result we find that these are men who are prepared to follow David. And there is a record here of 39 distinguished mighty men that David had. 39 mighty men. These men were prepared to give their lives to David as God's anointed king. Some of these men left Saul's service 
and went to follow David when David fled from Saul's presence when Saul attempted to kill him. And what we have here is a track of, of these lives of these men that really covers the period of David's uh, fleeing, hiding from, the, uh, from Saul, his time in the, amongst the Philistines, and his return and his becoming king. These men fought and laid their lives down. We have a glim already caught a glimpse of what made them prepare to do this as they heard of the testimony of David, as they saw what had happened to him. But this brings a question to my mind at least. What distinguishes those recognized as mighty men? Now, over 50% of us are thinking this doesn't apply to me like then. Well, it does apply to all of us. It does apply to all of us. And it does have an impact on all of us. Although each of our three titles focuses on men, Nevertheless, it is not out of place for any of us to think about what we're going to be considering tonight. So what we're going to look at first is the mighty men of David. That's obvious. That's what we have here. And then we will look at the mighty men of God. And then you may smile at this one, the mighty men of Chorley. But nevertheless, that's what we're going to look at. The mighty men of David, the mighty men of God, and the mighty men of Chorley. So the mighty men of David... These are the mighty men whom David had. First of all, they were willing men to follow David. That is obvious, isn't it? Uh, they had given their strength, their abilities, into the service of David. They saw something in his life that they, uh, their hearts agreed with. You know, if you're going to fight for somebody, and you're going to take orders from somebody, you want to be pretty sure that you trust this individual. And there was a trust in David's life, but not just David's life. God was with him. God was clearly with David. He'd been with him with Goliath. He was with him as he led out the children of Israel on many occasions. And he would come back to the shouts of the people. that They, they would say, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. And there was something in David that these mighty men, their hearts agreed with. Not just their minds, but their, their hearts were attuned with. There was also something they were prepared to follow his example. You know, he wasn't a man who just shouted his order, he was a man who did it. He had done it there in the beginning with Goliath, but he, he went out time and time again and he led his men out. He, he went out in front of them, he fought with them until quite recently in this book of Second Samuel, he has been going out with his soldiers and he has been fighting them. Only when his life has become too costly for them have they determined that he should stay at home. But they saw his example. And the first three men show something of, of that, their preparedness to follow uh, David. They came to him while he was at the cave of Adullam. Uh, they settled with him when he had this ragtag group of individuals made up of all kinds of men from all kinds of backgrounds, and they came prepared to follow. So something here that is mentioned among the first three men particularly, they gave honor to God. If you're going to follow a man of God as David was, you must expect that the victories that you are involved in, the things that you do, will also, the honor will be given to God. And so it is in the first, free, in the first men, the victories are ascribed to the Lord. And the Lord is also worshipped as a result of their actions. You see in the action of Bethlehem, where these three men go down into Bethlehem, fight for the Philistines, go to the well, bring out the cup of the bottle of water, whatever they contained it in, and brought it back to David. And David poured it out before the Lord in an act of worship to praise God that these men had laid their lives down. He saw it as an, an act of worship in what they did. He could not drink it. It was far too precious to him. And along with this, as you think beyond the first three men, and their willingness to follow David, their preparedness to honor God, there was also a lasting impact of their lives. The free men at the beginning, none attained to their level, but they were followed by others, 34 other men, including the man Abishai and Benaiah. 
Abishai was no slouch, was he? He was the brother of Joab, the commander of David's army, as the son of Zeror. He went out, he killed 300 men at one time with his spear. And he was seen to be deadly with the fact. He was honored among them. He became captain of them, but he did not attain, even with the mightiness of his action. And then there's this man, Benaiah. He was the son of a valiant man. And he had done many deeds, including this unusual thing that often comes up in, used to come up in children's quizzes. Uh, school, uh, we had it at home when I was growing up. My parents, we'd often have the visiting preacher come to lunch. And we'd get out a little game called Cloud of Witnesses. And up would come this question and you'd watch the puzzled look on the preacher's face as he was unable to answer it. We always made sure he got it. Who was the man who went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion? Well, this is what Benaiah did. He went down into this pit, he killed this lion, but along with that he killed an Egyptian, a spectacular man. I don't think we've met too many of them, maybe, but that was what he was called. And he had a spear, and Benaiah didn't have a spear, so he went down with a staff, and he wrestles the spear off the man, and he kills him with his own spear. These men followed in the steps of others. They followed in the steps. They did similar actions. And their actions in this point also not only a lasting impact, but their action revealed complete trust. The last man in this list, Uriah the Hittite. He sums up in some way what we see in the others, because Uriah the Hittite, though David committed a, a, a sin against him in adultery with his wife, he followed the orders of David even to his death. He would do whatever his king commanded. He trusted him. He would follow. These were mighty men indeed. Not just in the strength of their arm, but in their preparedness to follow their commitment, their honor of God. Their lives made an impact on the men around them who would fight alongside them. When you've got men so committed, it is easy to make even the weakest man sometimes to fight with you and to come with you. And so these men were mighty men of David. But secondly, they were mighty men of God, or at least some of them were mighty men of God. As we say, there are three men here who are made distinction of, and they are the opening men recorded. Abishai and Benaiah, as we saw a moment ago, did many mighty things, but along with others, they did not attain to these three. These three men were set apart, something distinct about them. And in two of their cases, I think we see something here that sets them apart. And what we read of the context of 2 and 1 Samuel, I would suggest to you that this is what sets these men apart. It was their personal faith in God. It is the distinct way their actions are recorded. If we take the first man, it's not said of him, this man Adino, we'll use that name, it's easier to pronounce, he killed 800 men at one time. But after him, there was Eliezer, and he was one of the three mighty men, and they defied the Philistines. And there he stands uh, to fight. The Israelites retreat from him, and they run away, but he arose and went the other way. Imagine that scene. Here come all the men of Israel running towards you, saying, get out of the way, come on, let's get out of here. The Philistines are coming. And he says, not on your nelly, I'm going for this. And he gets his sword in his hand, and he goes to the Philistines. And the next thing you know, you can watch the Israelites turning round, and the only thing they do is pick up the plunder behind this man. And it says that the Lord gave, him the, gave them the victory that day about a great victory that day. What a great victory. It wasn't the man. It was God. God with the man. And then there is this next man, Shammar. And he's the man who stands in a field of lentils. lentils. Your chosen place to stand in the day of battle, isn't it? Surrounded by food. Well, this is where he is. 
the Philistines are there. Again, the people fled from the Philistines. But he stationed himself in the middle of the field and he defended it and killed the Philistines and the, so the Lord brought about a great victory. And only twice in this whole section is this mentioned, although the free men going down to, the, down, to that, uh, down to Bethlehem is again pointed to the Lord. These men, their actions are attributed to their relation to God. God brought about a victory through them. The first, he wouldn't let go of his sword. His sword would have to be he pulled out of his hand. It had been clasped so much. But the Lord brought about the victory. Their actions were done then in the strength of the Lord. These were not natural actions. You didn't look at these men and think, you know, that well, they could definitely withstand the fighting of a whole uh, Philistine garrison. Uh, they would be able to take them on on their own. No, there was something unique and miraculous about what took place. And their actions were also seen, as we think of the men going down to Bethlehem, as a service of God. They did it because of the way in which they held David up in high esteem, but they held God in high esteem with David. And David attributes their actions with the Lord. He uses them to praise the Lord. Now, why can we make the distinction from the other men? Well, we don't say that of Abishai. Abishai, the, son, the brother of Joab, the, David often says, I, I want to be rid of you. I can't deal with you. They're not of the same spirit as David is, but these men appear to be men of God. It is evident there is a discernible difference between the mighty men of God and those of others. And we can see that not just in this passage here, but we see this in life. There is a world of difference between people doing things and God doing things through people. We looked a while back at Samson and, and many have drawn him with big bulging muscles and all these things, but I sometimes wonder if Samson indeed was not that strong in appearance at all. Where would the miracle appear? Rather, it was a strengthening of the Lord. And so it is with all those who God often chooses. He chooses the weak things. He chooses the, the insignificant things. He chooses the man who just says, I have had enough of this turning away from the Philistines and going back to fight. And he takes hold of his hand and his sword, and he gives him strength to fight and to deliver Israel. Although, these, all this, although a passing glance may suggest all these men are the same, actually there is a discernible difference between some and the men of God. Thirdly, the mighty men of Chorley, these are their names. Well, I can't give you their names, can I? But nevertheless, you know, there's nothing here, as we've said, to suggest that these men were, were different in strength or appearance of these things. But the might comes through our relation with God. These men who we have here were men in everyday settings who had a choice to make. They were no different to their neighbors. They were simple farmers, most of them, originally, looking after their dwellings, used to being raided on a regular occasions by the Philistines and others, and they lived a nomadic life, or a life that was under threat. And they had a choice to make. Here are the Philistines, they come and face us, and here is a man, and he trusts in God, and he will lead us to fight. Will we follow him? See, these men were fighting for their lives. It was a choice. We either fight against the Philistines or we serve the Philistines. And if we serve the Philistines, we will serve their gods. And if we serve their gods, then we will lose our relation with the living God. And we will lose our salvation. And we will lose our legacy. And they made the decision, we're going to fight. And we're going to fight with a man who believes in God, trusts in God, and will lead us with God. A man who we dare is a human being, but we dare to follow him because God is with him. Now we have a choice to make in our lives in that way, don't we? We can, we can sit back and we can just say, well, I'm not going to do much about this. I'm just going to do my little part. But, but we are called in the New Testament to be soldiers of Christ. 
to fight the good fight, to lay hold of Christ. There is no sitting back in the Christian faith. There is nothing of that. We, we have to fight. And who are we fighting with? Do we think well, we're fighting to follow the pastor? That's not a wise idea. Let's fight to follow Christ, our great captain, the leader of our, our warfare, our spiritual warfare, him who is victorious, who literally, like the man described here, went forth with his sword and struck down our enemies, and we come in to pick up what is left. But we must go prepared to fight. We have a choice. You go to work tomorrow, and you go to work amongst ordinary people and all these things, but there is a spiritual element to it as well, isn't there? They're involved in their own beliefs and their own ideas and their own thoughts. And though we can work alongside them in our work and we can support them in the things that they do and we can have several things in common with them, we cannot agree with them on the matter of their belief being equal with ours, their God being equal with ours, their viewpoint being equal with ours. We must learn to fight, just as Christ fought just as others have fought. There is that need also here, not only to be men, mighty men of God, mighty women of God, but to, sorry, to be mighty men, mighty women, but to be mighty men and women of God with a belief. What do you believe when you turn around from your colleagues who are running the other way and say, I'm going back and I'm going to fight? Uh, what do you believe when you stand in the middle of a lentil field and no one else is with you? You have to believe in God. Because it's no good believing in you, because if you work out the mathematics here, you're not going to be standing very long. You're soon going to be swept aside. You're just one person. Or when you look at David going out to face Goliath, where's his belief? Where's his trust? Is it in his sling and his stone? Well, he's pretty handy with it, but he's not that good with it. He believes that God will bring him down. It's the difference between the mighty men of Chorley and the mighty men, the men of Chorley. It's God. It's all the difference is. And yet it's all the difference is. God is the difference. Our faith in God, in his ability, his actions. We have seen Christ face our enemy and defeat him. The worst that can happen to us in life is to die. But death is defeated. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, grave, where is your victory? Also, we act with faith in God and leave the outcome to God. You think these men turned around and thought, you know, it's going to be easy, this. I'm going to take a stand in the middle of a lentil field surrounded by Philistines. It's, it's going to be easy. I'm sure to get the victory. No, they had faith in God that they would have a victory. But there was no guarantee. There was no guarantee. There was no guarantee they were getting home to their family that night. There was no guarantee they were going to walk away alive. It was the Lord who gave, and they gave the outcome to God. I'm going to face these Philistines because God has said he would be with me, and I have faith in God, whatever the outcome. I'm reminding that statement of, Dave, of Daniel's three friends who said would not bow down to the golden image which Nebuchadnezzar had made. And Nebuchadnezzar had said, if you don't bow down, I'll, call, I'll bring you to a fire and I will send you, you into the fire and you will be destroyed. And these three men would not bow, so they are brought to Nebuchadnezzar. And they said to Nebuchadnezzar, know this, our God is able to deliver us from the fire. But even if he doesn't, Nebuchadnezzar, he's still God. That's faith, isn't it? Even though I will go with God, I will trust God, I will believe in God, and I will leave the outcome to God. Because his will will be done. See, 2 Samuel 23 informs us that men and women need a reminder. When these men saw or heard of David, it made an impact on their lives. There's a man I can follow. There's a man I can give my life to serve. There's a man who I agree with. He is fighting the Lord's battles. They're the battles. 
Why should the Philistines reign over us? Why should these enemies defeat us? God gave us this land. God should be glorified in this land. I will go with him. You will note also here, the Bible is not ageist about these matters. There are various details we are not told about these men. We're not told of the sacrifices their wives made to let them fight. Some of these men were married men. Or the children that they left home when they fought. We are never told their age, how old they were. See, the Bible is not ageist. And neither should we look at this passage and say, well, that's a young man's game to be a mighty man of God or a mighty woman of God or to encourage another, our husband or whoever, to be a man, a woman, a man of God. Bible's not ages. Moses, at 80 years of age, God gives him the job of a lifetime, a job which he wanted to get out of a few times along the way, I'm sure, to lead the children of Israel, to go to war. Who am I? Think of Caleb. At 80 years of age, having wandered the wilderness for 40 years, he comes to Joshua and he says, give me this mountain. Mordecai, a nameless un uh, uh, nobody, an uncle of a beautiful young Jewish girl. We are not told his age, but he was a man of God who knew that the Lord might be in the circumstances and had brought her, his niece to the kingdom at, for such a time as this. Or we could think of the Apostle John, who we've read his letter now many times over these Sundays. At what age did he write these let things? Many think that these were near the end of his days. Days of suffering and struggle. And here were the days when he wrote down the things that would benefit us today. Mighty men. Men in everyday circumstances who make the choice to fight. The fight of faith. Believing God and not giving excuses as to why they should not do it. With a trust in God that will act in faith and leave the outcome to God. See, passages like this stir us up, don't they? They send us out and think, yes, there's a fight to be fought and we can win the day and do. Yes, that's true. But the outcome is with God. Not with how enthusiastic we feel about it. Not with how powerful we might feel about it. Our trust and faith is with God. And these are the mighty men of Chorley. Not those running around brandishing swords or going out and spoiling for a fight, but individuals who lay hold of God and will go and do as God says in their ordinary lives, trusting in him. One concluding remark to make here this evening, and it is in that last name that is mentioned again, Uriah the Hittite. 37 in all. This is the man who you would not expect to find on the list. You would want to think that David would leave this one out. He's a bit of an embarrassment, isn't he? Not because of Uriah the Hittite, but because of David's relation to him. You know, he reminds us that Uriah the Hittite completely trusted David. But David misused that trust. We know that God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, will never misuse our trust in them. But nevertheless, there are those men who we place our trust in because they are placed before us as those to follow or to lead by example. These men need prayer because they can misuse their power and our trust and harm our lives, not eternally, but certainly in the here and now. Uriah the Hittite is an example of that. David's failing, though he was trusted by these mighty men, they were prepared to follow him. He took advantage of that trust. And we should be mindful when others trust our example and our ways and, and us and come to us for advice, let us not misuse our trust, but pray for one another that the real trust will be always in God and God alone.
and we would treasure the trust that others place in us. There are those in our church that one day we hope will be men and women of God. They're only children now, but they trust us. Let us pray that we will not misuse that trust, but rather we will lead by example, that they will attain not to us, but beyond us in the things that God would end.